Hi, my name is Andrew Nevins with the Division of Infectious Diseases at Stanford University, and in this video, I'll be talking about the acute manifestations of Epstein-Barr virus infection. The learning objectives for this video are to recall the microbiologic characteristics of Epstein-Barr virus, to explain Epstein-Barr virus pathogenesis leading to acute infection, to describe the clinical presentations of EBV infections, and to recall the differential diagnosis of the mononucleosis syndrome. This is our pathogen map, and for this video, I'm focusing on viruses, particularly the DNA viruses, and specifically Epstein-Barr virus, which is one of the eight human herpes viruses. The family herpes viridae consists of three subtypes, the alpha, beta, and gamma herpes viruses. One of the hallmark features of the herpes viruses is their ability to maintain latency in particular cells in the body, and then potentially reactivate to cause different disease processes later. The alpha herpes viruses include the neurotropic viruses, herpes simplex virus 1, herpes simplex virus 2, and varicella zoster virus. These viruses have a short reproductive cycle, which means that they reproduce more quickly than other subfamilies of herpes viruses. These viruses establish latency in the sensory ganglia of nerve cells. Beta herpes viruses include cytomegalovirus and human herpes viruses 6 and 7. These viruses tend to reproduce less quickly than other herpes viruses with slow cell-to-cell -cell spread in culture. The beta herpes viruses establish latency in many non-ganglionic sites, particularly leukocytes. Epstein-Barr virus is one of the two gamma herpes viruses, the other being human herpes virus 8, the causative virus for Kaposi's sarcoma, multicentric Castleman's disease, and primary effusion lymphoma in AIDS patients. Epstein-Barr virus is far more common in the general population and is the focus for most of this module. The hallmark of the gamma herpes viruses is replication in lymphoblastoid cells. For Epstein-Barr virus, latency occurs in lymphoid tissue, whereas for HHV-8, latency is in B lymphocytes and monocytes. Like the other herpes viruses, Epstein-Barr virus is a large lipid-enveloped DNA virus. There are multiple surface glycoproteins that induce immunogenicity. Unlike some other microbes, however, there are several virus-specific antigens that are immunogenic and to which the body produces antibodies. For example, for cytomegalovirus, another herpes virus, both IgM and IgG antibodies measure a CMV-specific glycoprotein located on the virus exterior. For Epstein-Barr virus, on the other hand, there are three virus-specific antigens. The viral capsid, located on the virus exterior, early antigens, which are induced by replicating infected B cells, and so-called nuclear antigens, which encode for proteins produced by infected and transformed B cells. We will discuss these EBV-specific antigens in more detail in a subsequent video in this series. Infection with Epstein-Barr virus usually occurs via the oral transfer of saliva. If the virus is able to avoid clearance by mucosal barriers, it then can colonize the epithelium in the oropharynx, including salivary glands and tonsils. There, it replicates and can then infect B cells by binding to the CD21 receptor on the B cell surface, resulting in internalization of the virus. Either EBV causes the B cell to enter a lytic phase, or to progress towards a latent phase, depending on which proteins are synthesized during infection. During the lytic phase, new viruses are synthesized. A number of transactivator proteins and lytic genes are expressed, some of which produce a homologue similar to interleukin-10, which inhibits Th1 T cells. Since Th1 T cells are inhibited, the secretion of interferon gamma, which activates macrophages, does not occur. Thus, EBV suppresses the immune system by inhibiting the activation of macrophages. Other lytic gene products serve to enhance replication, metabolism, and blockade of antigen processing. Other lytic gene products serve to enhance replication, metabolism, and blockade of antigen processing. Yet others encode proteins with structural roles or that help to evade the immune system. At the end of the lytic phase, the cell is able to release newly replicated viruses, which can then enter other non-infected B cells. These cells, in turn, can then enter the lymphatic circulation and spread the virus to other lymphoid tissues. 
EBV can also induce an infected B cell to enter the so-called latent phase, which involves the synthesis of different proteins that exert effects on the cell, transforming it into a cell with potentially unlimited growth potential. We will discuss viral latency in further detail in a subsequent video. Following the release of new viral particles into the circulation, the virus spreads until antigen-presenting cells stimulate CD8-positive T cells. During the lytic phase, these CD8-positive T cells, specific for lytic gene products, find the EBV-infected B cells bearing these proteins and kill them. The resulting proliferation of these CD8-positive T cells, along with the release of cytokines, lead to the systemic signs and symptoms of primary EBV infection. Other non-infected B cells also respond and differentiate into plasma cells that produce antibodies to the virus. Lymphocytes are therefore integral to the pathogenesis of Epstein-Barr virus. These lymphocytes can take on an altered appearance compared to lymphocytes as more commonly seen on a peripheral blood smear. These so-called reactive or atypical lymphocytes are those that become large as a result of antigen stimulation. In comparison to a normal lymphocyte, they can be more than 30 microns in diameter with varying size and shape, and the nucleus can be round, elliptical, or irregular in other ways. The cytoplasm is more abundant and can contain basophilic granules or vacuoles. Reactive lymphocytes are not specific to acute Epstein-Barr virus infection and can be associated with a number of other viral infections, some bacterial or protozoal pathogens, and some non-infectious etiologies as well. As discussed earlier, it is the proliferation of virus-specific CD8-positive T cells and the release of cytokines that leads to the signs and symptoms of primary EBV infection. The classic syndrome of mononucleosis is defined as a clinical triad of fever, pharyngitis, and adenopathy. The symptoms of acute EBV infection, however, are many and can include a constellation of general symptoms, including fatigue, headache, and loss of appetite, systemic symptoms, including fever, chills, and body aches, swelling, erythema, and exudate or white patches in the tonsils, sore throat and erythema in the throat, lymphadenopathy, cough, nausea. In some instances, there can be enlargement of the liver, although a more common etiology of abdominal pain is due to enlargement of the spleen as a major lymphoid organ. It's important to note that shedding of virus still occurs even after symptoms resolve. Salivary glands are the recognized repositories of EBV, and periodic shedding from such tissue is a necessary feature of the virus's biology. Shedding is sustained for months after infection and then falls gradually. Immune compromise, for example in transplant recipients and patients with the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, can lead to higher and prolonged rates of shedding. Now, the symptoms of acute Epstein-Barr virus infection, the mononucleosis syndrome, are of course nonspecific. Although acute Epstein-Barr virus is a common cause, symptoms of the mononucleosis syndrome can be caused by a wide variety of other pathogens. For example, other viruses, most notably acute cytomegalovirus infection, can mirror acute Epstein-Barr virus infection. It's important to think about acute HIV infection, the so-called acute retroviral syndrome, so a detailed sexual and drug use history may be important. Other viral infections include acute viral hepatitis, influenza and other respiratory viruses, parvovirus, and rubella. In addition to viruses, a number of bacterial pathogens can produce a similar syndrome, including, for example, syphilis in the secondary or spirochetemic stage, disseminated gonococcal infection, many rickettsial infections, and bacteremia and endocarditis due to many possible organisms. Other infections include acute coccidiotomycosis, or in some instances, other endemic fungi, and some protozoal infections, particularly malaria or toxoplasmosis. It's also important to keep in mind that several non-infectious etiologies can lead to similar symptoms as well, such as some rheumatic diseases, malignancies, and drug reactions. Like other members of the herpes virus family, following acute infection, the Epstein-Barr virus can remain dormant and lead to reactivation disease at a later time.